about the king coming into Jerusalem, the king of glory, the Lord. I mean, it's exactly how it's stated here. Coming into Jerusalem, through the gates of Jerusalem, from the Mount of Olives, to bring the presentation of the king, not just to be rejected and crucified on a Roman execution rack, but to be hailed as king and to reign over the earth. Number three on your outline, that's the anticipation and arrival of Christ that we should think about. And because he is God, fully God, I'd like you to put it down that way. Number three, you need to anticipate God's arrival because this passage is not just messianic in the sense of his first coming. This is prophetic in terms of the eschatological sense of his second coming. Jesus is coming back. And the idea of us seeing ourselves as owned by God and living as though we are owned by God then gets us to the place of realizing that becomes an urgent and, and, and necessary priority because that king that you say owns you is coming back. And he's coming back soon. Let me show it to you. Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14. We don't spend much time in that book generally, but I'd like you to spend some time in it now. It's very complicated in terms of his history. But the view in the last chapter is so clear. Zechariah is easy to find. You just, if you've got an old-fashioned Bible, go to Matthew, turn back two books, and you'll find it. Second to last book of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 14, the last chapter. Now, in this scene, God is prophetically looking forward to a great battle that's going to take place, and the only way to solve this battle is for God himself to show up and be the warrior. That's the picture. If that sounds familiar, like what's going on in the book of Revelation, you got it. Matter of fact, the battle is named in the book of Revelation the Battle of Armageddon. And in that picture, you see God swooping in to be the one who saves the day. He does it himself. But look at how it's depicted here. Let's start in verse 3. Zechariah 14, 3. Then the Lord, you see the capital O-R-D? Yahweh, the triune God, will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. This is more than tipping over a few tables, making a whip out of a, you know, making a, a whip out of a, of, out of a, a, a piece of leather and driving people out of the Temple Mount. Matter of fact, this is a victorious day of establishing a rule. As it says in the book of Revelation, when the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of our Lord, God, Yahweh, and of his Christ. That's the picture. What kind of day is this? God's going to show up. He's going to show up. And look at, in verse number four, he's got feet. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem. Are you talking serious here, geographical? Yeah, look at the geographical references. On the east, right? He's, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem, you recognize that. You look across the Temple Mount, which now sits the shrine of the Dome of the Rock, which used to be the temple, which in the day of David was a tent where they put the Ark of the Covenant. And you look across the Kidron Valley, you see that mountain, that, that hill called the Mount of Olives. Jesus was coming down that on, triumphal, on, on the triumphal entry on Sunday, coming across and into Jerusalem. The Bible says he's coming back now. If you might remember, when Jesus left the planet after his resurrection, Acts chapter 1 says he left his feet from the Mount of Olives, and they said, just as you saw him go, you saw his toenails leave this, this mountain. You're going to see him come back just the same way. His feet will touch this planet. To even think about God in these physical forms, usually they're anthropomorphic terms. In other words, God doesn't have feet. He doesn't have eyelashes. He doesn't have elbows or earlobes. But the God man does. And God Right? The fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. The exact representation of the nature of God is now here, the second person of the Godhead. He comes in his first coming in humility. He gets driven out of that temple mount outside the city gate, suffers the shame of, a, of, a, of an execution on a cross. And then he leaves and he says, you get about your work of building my church and I'll build it through you and then I'm going to come back. And when I come back, it says in this passage, the feet of God are going to land on the Mount of Olives. And that mountain is going to be split in two. Look at the seismic, you know, tectonic shifts here. And it's going to be split from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other half southward. Picture that. Verse 5. And you, it's dealing with the, the scene and the battle here, you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach Azel and you shall flee as you flee from the earthquake. This is historic during Isaiah's day. Flee from the earthquake during the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And then Yahweh, my God, will come. Listen to this phrase. And all the holy ones with him. Does that sound like a phrase you've heard before? Like on the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, when Jesus talked about his return, and he says the Son of Man's going to come in his glory with his holy ones. 
Here's the picture of the return of Christ. I know it's a series of events in the prophetic calendar, but it culminates in the saving of God's people on that mountain when God comes back in bodily form with feet on the Mount of Olives and he comes with his holy ones. And on that day, it's a strange day, verse six, there shall be no light, cold or frost. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to Yahweh, neither day or night, but at evening time, there shall be light. Verse eight. And on that day, living waters shall flow out of Jerusalem, half of them to the Eastern Sea and half of them to the Western Sea. These are pictures that have been depicted throughout the Old Testament regarding the millennial kingdom, a kingdom on earth where Christ reigns and the ultimate son of David sits on a throne. That's the picture here. It shall continue in summer as in winter. This is going to be the same all year round. Verse 9, and Yahweh will be king over all the earth, all the nations subjected to him. On that day, Yahweh will be one and his name one. Now, that's a phrase that you might remember from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The word hear in Hebrew is Shema. It was called the Shema in Israel that they would recite this creed, the unity of God. There is one God. There's not a bunch of gods controlling the sea over here and a few gods controlling the mountains over here. There's one God. But that God was revealed from the very first chapter of the Bible as a plurality. And in that plurality, even here, we see that God coming in human form, touching his feet upon the Mount of Olives. But there will be, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, a unity of all things under God. Everything will be wrapped up in that triune, one singular monotheistic God that we have, and all things will be under him. All things will be made right. The kingdom is going to be delivered over to the Father. Here is this picture of the culmination of everything, and the whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimnon, south of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site, from the gate of Benjamin, does this sound literal to you? To the place of the former gate, to the corner gate, from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine press. Sounds very specific. Sounds very literal. Sounds geographical. And you mean to tell me that all these valleys are going to be filled in? Speaking of Handel's Messiah, does that sound familiar? Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 talks about the coming of the Lord and the coming of the Lord and in his glory being revealed to all flesh. And you know how it reads. I wrote it down. Here it is. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain will be made low. Every uneven place will be made level. Every rough place plain. Remember that line from Handel's Messiah? Well, that comes out of Isaiah 40. And I know we speak of that oftentimes in symbolic terms like when Christ comes back, all the wrong stuff's going to be made right. And everything that's wrong is going to be made right. That's more than poetic. That, according to Zechariah 14, is a literal geographic topography that's going to take place in Jerusalem. And the only thing that's going to be raised up is going to be one hill, the holy hill, the holy mountain. And people are going to come there to worship. And they're going to come there. And who's going to be enthroned there in the city of David? God himself, the God-man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's going to come through those gates. And now the fulfillment of this great passage, the gates are going to lift up their eyes, their heads, their, 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 their perception, and the king of glory is going to come in. 